what does that even come from? You know, yeah. I think that because mRNA vaccines are a technology that is new on a wide scale, it's not, it's not new, period. It's just new in the sense that we never had a product used on a wide scale that was an mRNA vaccine. Um, I think because it's new in that sense, um, people tend to think of it as something that is not actually a vaccine uh, because they don't really understand it. When you have this whole, I think the the fact that it's mRNA, right? It's, it's just nucleotides. Uh, people think of it as genetic material and they see that as something that is different and scary because whenever you start talking to the public about genetic material um they start to think gmos they start to think it's going to change my dna they start to think that uh, all these crazy things and so they just tend to they will gravitate towards this idea of it's not a vaccine it's something else that which is bad and scary well, but, tell me, tell me if my understanding of this is incorrect. Remember, I, it's been mm -hmm. a long time since med school, <laughs> and I studied this stuff. All right, mm -hmm. messenger RNA to me is basically walking up to a Starbucks and saying, "I want a mocha latte," and the Starbucks or the cell makes you a mocha latte. Mm -hmm. I don't own the Starbucks. I don't work there. I don't make the coffee. I just go up and order it. Yeah. Is yep. that basically what mRNA does? Yeah, that's a good analogy. I mean... No, even a blind squirrel gets a nut sometimes. <laughs> no, no, you, you remember this stuff. Um, the general concept that I think a lot of these people who don't think mRNA vaccines or vaccines are missing, or in Mercola's case, ign ignoring, um, choosing to be a blind squirrel that doesn't get a nut, um, <laughs> um, is this concept of the central dogma of molecular biology where information flows from DNA to RNA to protein. That's generally how it works. Um, and so constantly in your body, mRNA is being made. It's like, it's like your, your nucleus and your DNA is the library and you're going into the library copying down some notes and then taking those notes out of the library. Those notes that you copied is the mRNA. Or directions um, from an atlas. You know, I, could, yeah. I could write out directions to Houghton Lake on, a, on an index card after looking at a map. And the, the little index card that I have with the directions on it mm -hmm. is my mRNA analogy. Right. Yeah. The, the, um, the information is being stored in the nucleus and then to access access that information little copies of that information are going to go out of the nucleus and that's what's actually going to cause the machinery in your cells to do stuff to make protein which actually does the work in your cells your body has a system of regulating these things which means that when even though mRNA is constantly being made, it's also constantly being broken down, right? Because if a gene turns on and it's being transcribed into mRNA and that mRNA is going to make to trigger the ribosome to make protein, you don't you might not want that protein to be constantly getting made. So the cell has ways of constantly destroying mRNA. Uh, mRNA itself is not very stable. It's not going to last very long uh, in the cell relative to DNA uh, or relative to even a protein. So MRA, mRNA is not self-replicating, is it? Uh, no, it is not. Whereas um, DNA is. Yes. There are, there's an enzyme to specifically replicate DNA into DNA, and there's an enzyme specifically to uh, read the DNA and make mRNA from it. There is no enzyme in the human body to recognize RNA and make RNA from it. Um, at least not to a degree that would be biologically relevant for foreign mRNAs. 
All right. Now, it's my understanding that with the COVID vaccination, mm -hmm. okay, they take, they manufacture RNA specifically, and they encase that in a little bubble of lipid. And then you inject that into a muscle. The little bubble of lipid interacts with the cell membrane, mm -hmm. goes and opens up a vacuole. That mRNA goes in, the cell starts making spike proteins that are found on the outside of the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. All right, they're not making the virus. There's no virus yep. in it. There's no fetal tissue in it. There's nothing right. else other than this little bubble. It's like smoke in a, in a soap bubble. The bubble merges with another bubble. The smoke goes into the other bubble and the bubble does something. All right. Yes. Now, yeah. we didn't just come up with the idea of mRNA uh, vaccines in 2019 when COVID showed up, did we? No. There's, there's, we've seen, we've seen coronaviruses before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and mRNA vaccines themselves have been in development for at least 30 years. Yeah. I mean, it's been a, there's been a lot of work that has gone into it. Um, but you know, uh, uh, along the way, there were key advances that had to happen. Um, like I said, mRNA is not very stable. Um, people who work with mRNA in the lab know, know that if you look at it wrong, it degrades. Um, and then your experiment's ruined. Uh, yep. So scientists had to figure out how to make it a little more stable so that it could last long enough in your cells to actually produce protein. Uh, they had to figure out how to deliver it to your cells. Um, they had to figure out how to do all of that safely. And work of the work of Catalin Carrico was instrumental to a lot of that. She did amazing work. When was that? Roughly. Uh, Car Carrico? Um, in the 2000s was when she figured out how to make mRNA stable enough to um be read by your cells but still be degraded in a normal time scale well let me just do a little bit of the history of the mrna vaccine and mm -hmm. coronavirus all right the first there, there's 10 or 12 different coronaviruses out there most of which are relatively minor problems not some some of them aren't even problems in humans you know, they're, they're of concern to chickens or pigs or something or other. Mm -hmm. But in 2004, we had a rather significant outbreak of a coronavirus illness, and that's called SARS. Mm -hmm. Now, SARS had the potential to be a pandemic like, like COVID is, all right? But it was controlled very early on. Uh, there was a big clamp down. There was a public health clamp down. People were walking through temperature scanners at airports, and if they were even a fraction of a degree warm they were pulled off the planes we really took that seriously and the other thing that we did in 2004 was we started working on a vaccine for it mm -hmm. uh, now when SARS did not turn out to become a pandemic uh, the money for the vaccine development dried up yeah. and at that time they had gotten in some very early results from it and they had some immunological problems that were caused by the vaccine now, you discussed that in your series when you talked about this, but there were problems that arose with the vaccine uh, in the early trials before they started working with humans. And it was uh, some sort of a, uh, it was uh, an immune response reaction. Mm -hmm. And they studied that over the next few years and they solved that problem. Yep. And then I think it was about 2014, we had something called MERS, Middle Eastern mm -hmm. or Respiratory Syndrome, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. That was a very deadly virus. That had a mortality rate on the order of 60%. That reinitiated research into mRNA and mRNA vaccinations and, and coronavirus disease. However, like SARS, very fortunately, that was very self-limiting. You know, the key to being a successful virus is, you know, you need to be able to occupy a host without killing it. Mm -hmm. And MERS tended to kill the host. And that right. dropped the r naught down below one, and you couldn't really spread it very well. But they, they worked on it some more then. And then in 2019, COVID came out, and they have identified the agent that causes COVID. They've also sequenced the agent 
you know, the virus that causes COVID. Mm -hmm. All of this machinery was there. A lot yep. of the, the, the groundwork had been done. And by throwing enough money and having enough political will, we were able to develop a virus or a, we were able to develop a vaccine rather rapidly. Mm -hmm. Now, were corners cut with the development of the vaccine? With the COVID vaccine? No. Okay. No. So there did it little... have three phases of clinical trials? It did. Yes. Did it have the full amount of clinical trials? Yep. Three is the normal number of yeah. clinical trials that is required. And COVID mRNA vaccines had three phases. Yeah, and they had three phases. And the third phase, which is the human trials, lasts three months for basically any approval, doesn't it? Yeah, the clinical trials for COVID mRNA vaccines lasted um, a few months. At that point, they had all the data that we needed to say that these vaccines are safe and we know that they're going to be effective. Okay. Um, now we need to roll them out to the larger population and confirm that safety and, and watch the efficacy over time. Well, I think one mistake that a lot of people make is they think that COVID was approved on an emergency basis, and that somehow meant that they cut some corners. Now, right. on an emergency basis approval, you know, when you're getting your your third phase trials on a vaccine that looks pretty good and pretty promising, the difference between a standard approval and an emergency approval is generally on a standard approval, you start manufacturing the vaccine after the third trial is done, whereas on an emergency basis... They give you permission to manufacture the vaccine during the third phase to save time. Right. But you're not allowed to release it. Yep. So the day that the phase three trials are approved, cool, I got 4 billion doses of vaccination that I can give today. Mm -hmm. Is that yeah. basically it in a nutshell? Yeah. The, the main purpose of an emergency use track is to get, it's to expedite the processes of vaccine research. It's not the research, but the manufacturing, oh. right? So it's the expedite the clinical trial process and okay. the manufacturing. Um, right. So normally the way it would go is a company will do a phase one trial, submit that data to the FDA, wait for the result, wait, wait for the feedback to come. If they get the green light to go to phase two, they do that, submit that to the FDA. And then they wait. There's the waiting time between those is can be can be uh, years. It can be a very long time, um, just because of bureaucracy and money. Uh, but with an EUA, all of that is prioritized and expedited. It's like it's like if you order a package on Amazon and you pick the free shipping, it's going to take, and it and it takes like. 20 days to get to your house from from Europe or something. But if you click Prime, you're expediting the process. It's still going to get to your house the same way you expected it to. It's just going to be prioritized by the company. So it's going to happen faster. And the only difference between the two is how much money you're willing to pay for the shipping. Right. So it still travels the same routes. Yep. But you pay more. Yep, and that's what happened with COVID vaccines. There was a very there was a need to get them out fast because ec economically, companies and governments were not looking good with um, restrictions. That's partly why the rest the lockdown restrictions and such were politicized. But they had an interest not only to preserve the economic stability of. Uh, their country, but also the health of its citizens. So there was a big push to put a lot of money into this purely to expedite um, and prioritize the process. Well, they um, also had four separate companies working on it independently. Oh, yeah. Two of them later joined forces. Mm -hmm. But you had multiple companies trying to get this done and you know basically we're going to fund all of you because we want one of you to come up with one now right and you know pfizer came up with one um uh, johnson and johnson came up with one that works a little bit differently and mm -hmm. and what's the what's the last one there's moderna moderna that's it sorry yeah brain cramp <laughs> old guys and boomer brain yeah it's moderna I forget to <laughs> yeah but, and I've had, um, I, you know, I've personally had, I've had um, three doses of Pfizer and one dose of Moderna. 
and mm -hmm. you know i still got covid but you know i got covid in september uh, my wife mm -hmm. gave it to me thank you honey but um <laughs> She is a, she's a nurse down at a local university, and she came home with COVID one day, was kind enough to give me a case of it as I was taking care of her. And, you know, we were pretty sick for about a week, and we had some residuals for a month or two. But um, I didn't end up in the hospital. I didn't die. And I right. think that's because I was vaccinated. And at least my body had a running start to, to, to fight it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's I think that's a really big misconception from anti-vaxxers uh, and i'm yeah. sure it's been stoked by mercola this idea of oh well you got vaccinated but you still got covid yeah i don't think people realize that no vaccine is going to protect you against actually getting infected in the long term in other words no vaccine is uh sterilizing you're still going to get infected you're just you just may not ever notice because your body has prevented it from making you sick. That's the case with polio. You know, if you're vaccinated against polio, polio can still infect your intestinal tract. It's just not going to make it to your central nervous system and cause paralysis because you're vaccinated. Um, same with measles. You know, your measles is probably circulating in the population still, but our vaccination numbers are high enough that kids aren't getting sick and getting the rash from it so or the no encephalitis or the death right right you know and so no one no one notices that it's going around you know in the mid-60s before they really had a, a good measles vaccine out there in the mm. united states alone you know i mean everybody had measles right uh in the united states alone we had on the order of 700,000 hospitalizations and 48,000 deaths from measles in yeah. 1966 yeah. 1967 a lot of people don't think about that. You know, we're one of the pro. you know, this is a definitely a first world problem. We have the luxury of being able to worry about the gluten in our food because we're not burying our children. Yeah. And that is that is something that I think a lot of people forget about. 